Hey, two days ago I received the new Nintendo Game & Watch Super Mario Bros. handheld and it arrived one day before the official release. Awesome. And being a hardware hacker, I immediately wanted to take it apart and hack it. I published my progress on Twitter and after a couple of hours I got it. My own modified Super Mario Bros. ROM on the Nintendo Game & Watch. One day before the official release of the device, it was already hacked. In this video, I want to walk you through the process and show you exactly how it works and how you can reproduce it at home. Let's start by looking at the actual device. It's pretty simple. It has a D-pad, the usual B and A buttons, three additional buttons for switching between game mode, time mode and for pausing the game and setting the time. It also has a power button on the side and underneath it a USB-C port. This USB port is only for charging and the data pins are unfortunately not connected to the processor. This means that for modding it, you will have to open up the device and it probably won't be possible to flash it via the USB port. Speaking about opening it up, the device uses Nintendo's tree wing screws and so if you want to open one up, you need to make sure to have a fitting tree wing. I'm using the 2.5mm one and so let's open it up. The first thing I recognized was the battery. It's the same as the one in the Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons. But let's look at the rest of the hardware. The main processor is an STM32H7B0, a microcontroller with slightly over 1MB of RAM and 128KB of flash. It's a Cortex-M7, which is quite different from the Cortex-A7 used in the NES and SNES Classic. The Cortex-M7 can't run Linux and so we can expect the device to run a more or less bare metal firmware. The next chip is a Micronix 8 megabit or 1 megabyte SPI flash chip. It comes in an SOIC 8 package, making it very easy to dump. The other chips are the charging circuit, speaker amplifier and so on, and not really interesting to us. Now microcontrollers generally have a debug port such as JTAG, or in the case of Cortex-M, JTAG and or SWD, serial wire debug. Via this port, you can flash the device, read firmware, single step through the program and so on. These ports are often exposed for the engineers on some easy to access pins and if we take a look at the PCB, there are some unpopulated pins pretty close to the CPU. To verify whether this is actually the debug port, let's bring up the datasheet and check on which pins it exposes the debug port. On this package, LQFP100, we can find the first signal we need called SWDIO on pin 72 and the second signal SWCLK on pin 76. In the pin overview, we can also see that the reset signal is brought out on pin 14. Before we measure this on the device, let's also quickly disconnect the battery. Simply use a small flathead screwdriver and lever it up. Now let's take our multimeter, set it to continuity mode and see whether these pins on the processor are connected to the contacts of the unpopulated header. And indeed, on the first pin we find SWCLK, on the second we get the supply voltage of the processor, the third one is ground, fourth is SWDIO and the last one is reset. Perfect. Now chances are high that this debug port was disabled in production, but it's always good to give it a try. And to do that I'm using an ARM debug probe. In my case I'm using a Zagar J-Link, but you can find a ton of different compatible debug probes online, starting at roughly like $3. I've also connected a couple of test clips to the debug probes so that I can easily get a good connection to the contacts without soldering. So let's hook them up. Finally, I'll connect the debug probe to USB and also provide power to the game and watch via USB-C. Note that I've got the battery disconnected. This will allow us to easily power cycle the device. I booted up the device and started the Super Mario Bros. game. Now let's jump over to the computer and see whether our debug probe can connect to the chip. Start JLink, select STM32H7B0 as the target, SWD as the protocol, and I will leave the debug speed at default. And success! The debug probe can connect to the chip. Perfect, it wasn't disabled in production. But unfortunately, when we take a closer look at the lock output, the chip is secured. The STM32 has a feature called readout protection, which can be set to one of three modes. RDP0, which allows full debug access, RDP1, which leaves the debug port enabled but prevents flash reads, though we can still access the RAM and so on, and RDP2, which completely disables the port. I should also note that in RDP1 we can reprogram the chip, but doing that would erase the flash contents and with that brick the device. So be careful when you are playing along at home. I already got the first email from someone who accidentally erased his device. Now in this case the device is set to RDP1, so we only have access to the RAM, which means we can't dump the firmware. However, Let's still go ahead and dump the three RAM areas and we will analyze them later. Next, let's dump the flash chip. 
To do this, I'm using a slightly modified TL866CS, though any spy flash programmer with 1.8 volt support should work. I've connected an SOIC8 clip to the programmer, which allows me to simply clip onto the flash chip. Also note that the programmer will power the flash chip, and so make sure to disconnect the battery and to unplug USB if you try this at home. With the clip attached to the flash chip, I can use Mini Pro to dump the contents of the flash. Now we have two things, a full dump of the RAM contents of the device, and also a full dump of the external flash memory. Now even though we couldn't dump the firmware of the device, this gives us quite a lot to look at. So let's start with the flash contents. To check whether the flash is clear text or encrypted, I ran an entropy analysis on the flash dump using Binwalk. A very high entropy, such as seen here, generally indicates that the contents are encrypted or compressed. As I couldn't find any compression header or so, I was pretty confident that it was encrypted. I also noticed that there were no repeating patterns or so, making it less likely that this was a very simple XOR pseudo encryption or maybe AES in ECB mode. Too bad, if the flash wasn't encrypted, this would be super easy but also far too early to give up. So let's take a look at the RAM dump next. The first thing I was curious about was whether the NES ROM of the game was loaded into memory. And so I opened the original Super Mario Bros. ROM in the hex editor on the right and the RAM dump on the left. Then I simply selected a part of the original ROM and searched for it in the RAM dump. And yes, the NES ROM is loaded into RAM. Perfect. Later on, I also found that the second ROM, Super Mario Bros. 2, is also always in RAM and that both ROMs are always loaded at the same addresses. For example, Super Mario Bros. 1 is always loaded at the address hex 2400 000. I also noticed some strange patterns in RAM, which looked a lot like graphics to me. I wrote a small Python script that treats the bytes as RGBA bitmap and displays it. And we can see the screen contents. Perfect, we found the two ROMs and the frame buffer. But this doesn't really bring us closer to running our own ROMs on it. We need to figure out the flash encryption. Now, given that we had a nice backup of the flash contents, I felt confident in trying to fiddle with it. I started by replacing a couple of bytes in the flash image with zeros in a hex editor and used the flash programmer to write it back to the device. After the flashing was complete, I tried to boot it up and after trying this a couple of times with zeros in different places in flash, I found that it still worked in most cases. This means that the device does not really verify the contents of the flash, which is quite an important thing to know when trying to understand the security implementation of a device. My assumption was that the NES ROM is somehow loaded from the encrypted flash, and so I kept putting zeros in random places in the flash, programmed the device and then dumped the RAM to see whether eventually the ROM data, which normally is always static, would change. And after only a couple of tries, I got lucky. The data of the NES ROM in RAM changed. I changed 4 bytes in the flash to 0 and now suddenly 4 bytes in the ROM also changed. This is awesome and it tells us a lot. It means that the ROM is loaded and decrypted from flash, it's not validated and that it's a bytewise encryption, not for example a block based encryption. We changed 4 bytes in the flash file and 4 bytes in the loaded ROM changed. Now it was time for some thinking and some analysis and eventually I figured out that if I XOR the original 4 bytes from RAM with the original 4 bytes from flash, I got exactly the same 4 bytes that were loaded into memory when I wrote zeros into flash. So we are looking at some XOR based encryption, such as maybe ASCTR. Now as we know the plain text, which is the NES ROM, and the cipher text, which we got from the flash dump, we can XOR them to get the XOR data stream that was used for the encryption, which allows us in turn to encrypt our own NES ROMs. I wrote a couple of scripts to try this and you can find them linked in the description. The first script takes a flash dump of the device and RAM image from the device and generates the XOR stream required to encrypt our own ROM. The second script takes a flash dump, the XOR stream and a modified ROM and creates a new encrypted flash image. I made some slight modifications to the original NES ROM and flashed it onto the device. So let's turn on the device, hit the game button to choose the first game. And yes, we are playing Hacked Mario Brothers instead of Super Mario Brothers, so we are able to upload our own ROMs to the device. Awesome. Now I also noticed that the emulator does some hot patching of the ROM, for example to show the 1985 to 2020 copyright string. So there's still a lot of work to do until we can freely put our own games onto the device. But the first steps have been made and we are able to execute our own NES code on the device. My next goal is to find a way to dump the firmware from the STM32 and if you're interested in that kind of stuff, feel free to subscribe to this channel. I hope you enjoyed this video and to see you on this channel again soon. Thanks!